I'm writing this one year after the death of my grandfather. He was about to turn 103 when he finally succumbed to the on-again, off-again battle with cancer he had been fighting for 20 years. First, it was his prostate, then his stomach, and finally his liver. A World War II veteran, it would be simple and convenient to describe him as a tough old bastard. But it wouldn't be accurate. He was too complex. Too thoughtful for that. Unflappable might be the best word I've heard used for him. My father described him that way. He said it was like my grandfather had seen things that scared him so much that a deadly but mundane thing like cancer barely even moved him. He never talked about his time in the war very much. I knew he'd served in the US Army and fought in Europe during 1944 to 1945. I pressed him hard on it once when I was a teenager, eager to hear about an explosive battle or extreme bloodshed. I pestered him until he silenced me with a look I had never seen in a man before or since. It was like he was staring at me from someplace else, somewhere thick with forbidden knowledge I was better off without. Then he said something to me I've never forgotten. If you keep asking questions like this, you'll have to share a burden with me no one else will understand. I'm strong enough to live with it. but. I don't know about you yet. What's an awkward middle school kid supposed to say to that? It was the first time my calm, genial grandpa who normally had answers for everything truly frightened me. It took almost another 30 years. But he eventually did decide to let me in on what he saw. Albeit posthumously. Once he knew the end was coming, he took an old journal out of storage and had it wrapped and set aside for me until he passed. It covered a year of his life after the Battle of Berlin in May 1945, when the Allies forced the Nazis unconditional surrender, until sometime in 1946, when he was assisting with the reorganization of post-war Germany. A particular section was bookmarked and labeled with a pair of sticky notes that read, I investigated a Nazi-occupied castle in 1945. For 80 years, my story was too dangerous to tell. And, grandson, do as you like. I got to reading it the week after the funeral. It was bizarre and read more like something out of a mid-century horror novel than a war journal. Upon finishing, I understood why he had kept this account to himself for so long. If true, and my grandfather was not one to fabricate or seek attention, it had the potential to threaten much of what we think we know about the war and even the human race. If taken seriously, it could also piss a lot of people off. My grandfather decided it was better not to share. But now, he had passed the decision on to me. After deliberating for a year, I have made a different choice. I'm going to share an excerpt from my grandfather's journal here, where it will either be dismissed as the fantastical ravings of a delusional young war veteran, or it will be believed. His story follows. From the journal of Jack Mikan, 2nd Lieutenant, United States Army. 4th Infantry Division July 20, 1945 On the orders of Major General Barton, I traveled to the small village of Weywillsburg, 50 miles east of Dortmund and 80 miles southwest of Hanover. I was tasked with investigating reports of strange behavior among the villagers. The area's focal point was Weywillsburg Castle a former SS sanctuary rumored to be the site of occult activity. The 83rd Armored Battalion seized the castle in April. After the 83rd departed, German civilians looted it of anything the SS had not previously taken with them. But when reports of hysteria and sickness later emerged, the general became concerned that remnants of the SS had returned to Weywillsburg. I did not have orders to enter the castle. Instead, 
Corporal Shays and I were to interview and assess the villagers and report our findings to the general's staff. I knew a platoon of 20 to 40 soldiers could be sent if the castle needed retaking. I saw myself as an odd choice for the assignment at first. I was not a doctor or trained to evaluate people. Corporal Shays reminded me that I spoke the best German of any American he knew. He was right. My ability to speak fluently with the villagers and my understanding of local history and customs might be all that was needed for now. The war in Europe was over, but the army's resources were spread thin, sorting out the mess Hitler had left us. We arrived in Weewilsburg at 1100 hours. The weather was sunny and clear, the hottest day of the summer to that point. The villagers had suffered little damage during the taking of the castle three months before. The only telltale sign of fighting was the collapsed roof of a one-story municipal building and patchwork repairs to cover up fire damage to several two-story houses. The castle loomed nearby on a low wooden hill at the edge of the village to our west. The stone structure was in the shape of a triangle with three straight wings four stories high and three circular towers five stories high. The north and south towers were intact but the southeast tower was in ruin with its top three stories demolished in a failed attempt by the SS to destroy the castle before they fled. I found it odd they wanted to destroy it. Weewilburg's castle held no strategic significance. Its purposes were purportedly educational and ceremonial. What could they be hiding? I wondered. No sooner had we exited the car. Then, a very curious thing happened. A villager, a tall man in his fifties wearing a Humber hat, approached us from one of the buildings. Are you not of the soil? He asked in some of the most polite, cheerful German I have ever heard. I'm sorry, but I don't know what you mean. I said to him, also in German. This place, it is strange. Are we all of the soil? He replied. The man looked at us with an unusual, idyllic expression. A slight smile with the mouth closed and the eyelids pulled back into their sockets. Are you from around here? I asked. Is this village your home? Around here? Of the air? It is a very fine place. He turned and surveyed the space around him, looking at it as a child might. I whispered my observation about the man to Chase. He did not appear to know where he was or even who he was, and the idyllic look never left his face. Chase noted that he had the habit of rubbing his forearms, and when he did, a layer of dirt rubbed off, as if it were flakes of his own skin. The man's face looked parched and dry, and when beads of sweat rolled down his forehead, the wet streaks seemed to turn to mud. Are you of the soil? The man asked Chase. Chase, who did not speak German, looked at me for instruction. Let's move along, I said, and see if there are more like him. We walked around him, down the village street. The man was following us when we looked back. We picked up our pace until we noticed he had stopped. He was now stooped over, talking to a young boy of nine or ten. It is well to prosper in the sun, the boy said to the man. Is it well? Yes, until the astronomical angle, the man said. Why does one prosper in the sun? Because aren't we all of the soil? asked the boy. Then the man stood up and pointed at us. They are not of the soil. They stood still and stared. Chase and I kept walking. We turned down several more streets. We saw dozens more villagers out and about. All wandered aimlessly and stopped only when they crossed paths with each other. Without exception, they exchanged bizarre pleasantries about soil, sun, air, trees, and blood. Some of these greetings were phrased as questions while others came as statements. There was no observable pattern. One would make a statement, then another would nod along with a question 
or offer another statement seemingly unrelated to the first. The blood runs thick when we are among the trees. Are we among each other when we are among the trees? Yes. Is it well to be among the trees? Is it well to be of blood? Are you of the soil? They would go back and forth like so, then carry on. Even I became confused, trying to translate their conversations for Shays. It was impossible to make sense of. We realized the villagers seemed to leave us alone if we kept our distance from them. They seemed aware of us, but did not approach unless we strayed within a few arm's length. More of them watched us through windows and doorways. Every one of them had the same look. It was an odd smile, stretched gently across their cheeks with a slight wrinkling of the eyes that suggested contentment. But there was also an uncomfortable curling of the upper lip, suggesting confusion. Shay said it was as if the entire village had the same face. On the east side of the village lay the abandoned site of the Niederhagen concentration camp. It had been one of the Nazis' smallest camps and did not function as an extermination camp in the way of the larger camps such as Auschwitz or Dachau. The inmates' conditions were still barbaric, but its primary purpose had been as a labor camp to expand and redevelop Wilberg's castle to suit Heinrich Himmler and the SS's liking. I decided to investigate the grounds of the former camp next. While walking, I thought more about the strange comments the villagers made. They bore some resemblance to the Nazi concept of blood and soil. This was the idea that a racist blood was intrinsically linked to the cultivation of their homeland soil and the nature that sprung from it. To the mind of a German racial theorist, superior land equaled a superior race. I had studied this racial doctrine as a way to better know my enemy, but I had never given it any credibility. The villagers' remarks seemed frighteningly close for comfort. Maiken, there are two villagers following us twenty yards back. Two women. Shays alerted me. By then, we had reached the perimeter of Niederhagen. I stopped and turned to the side, as if surveying the camp. I glimpsed the two women in my peripheral vision. They ducked and rushed to hide behind a building corner. Chase, they're different than the others, I said. We have to speak to them. Maybe they know what's going on. Chase and I circled the small building from opposite sides. We holstered our weapons. The women needed to not perceive us as dangerous. Still, one of them attempted to run for the trees when they saw us again. Friends, friends, I said in German. American? The woman who did not run asked. Yes, we are Americans, I said warmly. Ella, it's safe, the woman near us shouted to the one who ran. They look like them, the farther woman shouted back. Chase leaned in close. I think they're Jewish, he said. I looked at the new woman closely. She did look Jewish. I wondered if this could have something to do with why they were not behaving strangely like the other villagers. I guessed she was about 25. My name is Lieutenant Maiken, and this is Corporal Chase. I said to her, What's your name? Edith, the near woman said. Your soldiers liberated our village. I know you aren't a danger to us. Why is she afraid? I asked her of the woman who ran. She is my younger sister. She knows you aren't Nazis. But neither are the others in our village. She's afraid you'll soon become like them. Edith pointed at an old woman walking near the concentration camp boundary. The old woman stopped to bend down and look at a weed growing from under the fence. Her back was turned to us. But when she stood, the weed was now sprouting out of her neck, as if it had grown from under her skin. There were by now many more villagers wandering, dozens more in our vicinity alone. They all behaved in the same strange way. One man straight near Edith, 
he had the same idyllic look as the others. Do you not prosper in the sun? He asked her. I prosper in the sun. We all do. She replied, mimicking his tone of voice. The angle is high. To the sun and mensch. All is well. He nodded and carried on. A German word he spoke caught my ear. Son and Mensch. It had both a literal meaning and one far more sinister. I decided not to mention it to Chase until I knew more. Do you know what happened to them? I asked Edith once the men had left. Come with us. It's almost noon. I'll tell you everything I know, she said. Edith took us to a small cottage where she and Ella had been living for the past two months. Ella watched from across the room while her older sister told us what they had gone through. They had not been inmates at Niederhagen. Nazi policy was to intern prisoners at camps away from their homes. Prior to the war, Edith and Ella had lived their entire lives in Wewelsburg. Her family was evicted in 1938 and relocated to a Gerwin castle. Then, in 1942, they were forced to move again to Buchenwald, a large concentration camp 160 miles east of Wewelsburg. Their parents died there while the sisters were kept alive to mop floors, sew clothing, and please the SS guards. The 9th Armored Battalion liberated Buchenwald in April 1945, and by May, the sisters had returned to Wewelsburg. Their old family home had been demolished, so they took up residence in this abandoned cottage. Village life gradually returned to normal, until the date of June 21st. A neighbor of theirs claimed to see a group of a dozen men sneak into the castle at dawn. He assumed they were Americans, but they did not wear uniforms, so he couldn't be certain. Later that day, just after 1200 hours, everyone in the village suffered something horrible. Edith had been outside when it happened. A series of loud thrumming sounds filled the air, as if the village was some kind of giant radio receiver. She saw people's bodies spasm, limbs flailing, people falling down in the street. She saw one man's head twist so sharply that he snapped his neck and died where he stood. Every man, woman, and child in the village fainted. All at the same time. Everyone except for Edith and Ella. They had seemed were immune. The villagers awoke minutes later. They were shaken and confused. But they carried on with their days after tending to the injured. The situation worsened over the following days and weeks. People began to lose their personalities, memories, and knowledge of how to perform daily tasks, such as dressing and eating. It now made sense to me. Many of the villagers Shays and I had seen looked starved. Their clothes were filthy, and some were improperly worn. In time, many of them developed bizarre ailments that seemed tied to the very ground they were living on. Do you think you are immune because you are Jewish? I asked. I don't know, said Edith. But we have wondered that as well. Ask her why Ella is afraid of us. We weren't here when it happened, said Chase. I translated the question for Edith. There is a spirit in the air. It won't enter me. But I feel it, she said. Ella is afraid if you stay here for long. It will take you too. Do the others try to hurt you? I asked her. Not yet. But if we are outside at noon when the sun is highest and more of them are out, they will try to surround us. Are you saying they follow the sun? Yes, she said. Exactly. It was why Edith wanted us to come inside with them when we did. It was also why the number of villagers outdoors increased from the time we arrived. By now, it was mid-afternoon. The shadows cast on the ground were longer, and the numbers of villagers in the street fewer. 
Edith and Ella took us back outdoors and around the village. They showed us more people with strange ailments. We walked west across the village to where the woods surrounded the hill with the castle atop it. I spotted a pair of buzzards circling above the castle's north tower, a small species brown in color common to Europe. When we reached the trees, we were met with another curious and dreadful sight. A group of villagers, six men and women in all, were stuck to two large oak trees. They were attached at their stomachs and their backs, some with their arms and legs wrapped around the trunks. When I looked closer, I saw that where they touched, their skin and the bark became one. It even grew through the fabric where it touched their clothes. But their faces still had the idyllic look shared with all the others. Can they be freed? I asked Edith. She shook her head. At first, but not any longer. Then they showed us a man on his hands and knees alone in a field. He looked much like the man who greeted us on our arrival, but his condition was more dire. His hands and forearms were inseparable from the dirt and no longer looked like human flesh at all. I doubted if he could free himself if he had wanted to. His neck twisted stiffly as he looked up. His smiling lips flaked and parted. But when he moved them to speak, a fine dust spewed from his mouth. How long has he been out here? I asked. Alice spoke up this time, seeming at ease with us for now. At least three days. The sun is drying him out, but he refuses water. Then a brown buzzard swooped down and landed on the man's head. We scattered back and watched in horror as the buzzard grabbed the man's nose in its beak, snapped it clean off, and flew off into the sky. More dust fell from the open nasal cavity, but the man seemed not to care. We can't help these people, Chase said to me in English. I nodded to him, and then Edith took my arm. There is one more we have to show you, she said with a grim look. They took us back across the village in the direction of Niederhagen to a cottage much like theirs. Once I saw the villager inside, I understood why they had shown us this one last. The villager was a woman named Margaret, older than the sisters, but still of childbearing age. She was naked and lay on her side, on a wooden table. From her mouth grew a branch or a vine leading out a window to a tree abutting the cottage. The vine must have grown straight through the woman's innards as it came out her anus, sprouting leaves or vines. Shays and I both had to look away. Worse still, she was pregnant and the fetus grew externally on the woman's side. I saw a head, hands and a feet, all growing within a translucent layer of the woman's skin. The baby's father sat calmly still on a chair across the room. He was one of the villagers without a visible ailment, but the eerie idyllic expression was still present. It is well to be of the soil, the trees, the blood, he said to us. Do you know the Zonenmensch? There it was again, the word that frightened me. We need to contact the general right away. I said to Chase, we have to go back to our car. I then told Edith. Not now, she replied. It's almost dusk. Why? Chase asked in English. What does that matter? The astronomical angle, shouted the father while pointing out the window. It was the second time I had heard that phrase as well. I couldn't tell if he understood Chase or if he had noticed the position of the sun coincidentally at that moment. What happens at dusk? I asked. Something happens to them. They become crazy. It's not safe, said Ella. They're already crazy, I replied. We have to radio our general. Don't leave us. Help us, said Edith. 
We're going to get you help we can't give on our own. We won't leave. I promise. I told her. Shays and I left the cottage and checked back to the car we'd parked in the village center. Twilight was waning fast. The villagers had been out in numbers at noon and dwindled afterward. Now with night approaching, they were out in the streets again. We avoided them by moving quickly. Once to the car, I radioed HQ and briefed the staff sergeant on what we'd seen. I used less remarkable descriptions than I would have preferred. I needed a situation we will spurk to sound plausible. If I described it in detail, at risk not being believed. Then finally, I had a piece of information I insisted I deliver to Major General Barton personally. This is Barton. Go ahead, Lieutenant. The General said after a delay when the sergeant fetched him. General, I fear the situation here is more serious than we thought. Multiple villagers have mentioned a major Nazi war criminal. The son and mensch. Sir, I think we've located the solar man. I had already told Chase what I knew about this man on the way to the car. His name was Wolfgang Miller, and he was an Oberführer in the SS. A high officer's rank between a colonel and a brigadier general with no direct US Army equivalent. He was the most infamous senior SS member whose whereabouts remained unknown after Germany's surrender. His nickname referred to his habit of burning men alive. He was known to burn POWs, Jewish people, and even men under his own command who failed to perform to his standards. The saying was, like the sun, if you got too close to Miller, you burned. The general told me to stand by. As we did, the number of villagers in the street around us doubled. It was difficult to tell if they were surrounding us as Ella had worried or if they were simply following the vanishing sun. The little remaining twilight was behind the castle directly to our west. The sight of their dozens of eerie idyllic faces gave me a shiver. The general's voice came back over the radio. Mikan, I'm sending a squad to your location. One specially equipped to deal with things like this. Your orders are to remain in Wewelsburg until contacted tomorrow by Captain Parrott of the 14th Army. He'll brief you further once he and his men arrive. Do not enter the castle or attempt to find Miller on your own. Copy that, General, I said. I put down the radio. Shays and I traded nervous looks as the last traces of twilight disappeared beneath the horizon. Once the sky had blackened, a tall brunette woman near us threw an arm across her face, leaned back, and screamed. It was the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I had ever heard, even after two years of fighting on the front. More villagers followed, screaming, shrieking and moaning, dropping their peaceful expressions and thrashing their bodies about like victims of a rabbit plague. We have to get inside. Chase shouted over the cacophony. Stay in the car. We'll head for the sister's cottage. I shouted back. I climbed into the seat and turned a corner, narrowly avoiding running over a manic villager. More of them swarmed the car. I had gotten used to their strange daytime behavior, but this terrible panic was different. I feared not just for our own safety, but for theirs. The last thing I wanted was to inadvertently injure or kill any of them. I hoped Edith and Ella were safe too, and that they could provide us with shelter until morning. My grandfather's journal was the strangest thing I'd ever read. I had trouble believing it myself at first. Only once I took time to reflect did I realize it was not written as an official report to give to his general. It was handwritten in a plain notebook free of any US Army markings. I now understand he wrote it for himself, so he'd remember as much about the Wewelsburg incident as possible. I believe it was his intention to present it to the world one day, whenever he thought people were ready to hear it. A day he sadly never thought came. The more of it I read, the more I understood his decision 
and frankly, even began to agree with it. I'm still grappling with whether making it public is the right choice. I hope I'm not making a mistake. From the Journal of Jack Mikan, 2nd Lieutenant, United States Army, 4th Infantry Division, July 20th, 1945. We drove through the village until we reached the sister's cottage. I had to drive slowly. It was night and the whole village population was in the streets. I did everything I could to avoid hitting them, but they were running around frantically, screaming and bumping into the car from every side. There were too many for me to listen to any of them, but between their screams, I heard phrases of coherent German. The people had gone raving mad. But their nonsensical talk of soil, trees, and sun seemed to have stopped. Edith ran outside when she saw her car pull up. What's happening to them? I asked her. Mikan, look out! She shouted. I had just stepped out of the car when a woman came barreling down the street at me. My children! My children! What happened to my children? She wailed. I managed to step aside before she ran into me flailing her arms and letting out another blood-curdling scream. She was the same tall brunette we had seen in the village center, the first person to go rabbit after dusk. Help me grab her. Take her inside. I shouted. Chase and Edith rushed to my side. Together, we held on to the shrieking brunette and pulled her inside the sister's cottage. Ella shut the door behind us. Chase and I let go of the brunette so the sisters could guide her to sit down on a chair. Did she follow us all the way here? Asked Chase. I nodded, bewildered. She must have. It's Sabina, said Ella. The woman calmed down upon hearing her name. She sat with her eyes closed. Her breathing was uneven, and she moved in small odd twitches. What happened to all of them? I asked again. I don't know. It happens every night at dusk, Edith said. The sun goes down and they change. The sisters explained Sabina was a mother of three children. She was no Nazi, but her husband was forced to join the German Wehrmacht in 1941 and died fighting the Soviets on the Eastern Front. Sabina's children were living with her when Edith and Ella returned to Wewelsburg in May 1945. But once the strange behavior overtook the village in June and July, the children and their mother lost each other. Edith and Ella had not seen them. I already knew children were stricken by whatever this was, the same as adults, and I feared Sabina had succumbed to a grotesque fate. Then, Sabina started to speak. It was clear, but dreamlike. I want to see my babies. Find them for me. I want to hold them. Her eyes remained closed, and her hand reached up to cover her quivering mouth. Then, her whole face. If only I could die. I'm lost. I'm damned. It deeply affected Ella. She bent down on her knees and clutched Sabina's hands in her own. No, it's not true. You're not. She started to cry and hugged an unresponsive Sabina around her waist. We weren't lost, and neither are you. Sabina's hand drooped. I am lost. I am lost. Edith pulled Ella up. Ella wiped her face. The four of us sat in silence for a while, observing Sabina for any other strange signs. But she remained still. It was as if there had been an intermission in the spell hanging over the village. But the people had not returned to normal. Outside, we could still hear other villagers screaming and running amok. Chase and I were fatigued, and the sisters were a wally different kind of tired. They had been dealing with this alone for weeks, after spending years in a concentration camp. We were the first help they had received, and we were powerless to do anything. 
I try to assure them Captain Parrot's squad would be there tomorrow and they would be able to help. But the sisters found little solace in my empty promise. Then Sabina stirred. She raised her head and her eyelids slowly lifted. A pained look crossed her face and she covered her face in her hands once more. She let out four short breaths as if crying leaned her head back and focused her eyes upward while rubbing her jaw. She dropped her hand, leaving a single tear running down each cheek. Her lips quivered, her nostrils flared, and she gritted her teeth as her mouth gradually formed an expression that was truly chilling. She tilted her head to one side, then up, then slowly brought it across the other side all the while holding a frozen grin that bared her full set of teeth. Her eyes continued to gaze upward, as if looking at something invisible to the rest of us. It was different than the idyllic look we had seen earlier. This one was a look of mischief, the kind that came from knowing something we did not. Then, she went stock still, holding the frozen expression. Outside, check the others. I said to Chase. We opened the door. All of the villagers who had been running amok just a short while ago now lay flat in the street. They were all completely still. Those on their backs and sides with their faces showing all had the exact same look as Sabina. They all fell as one, said Chase. Did you notice the time at dusk? I asked. I did. 2105 hours, sir. I checked my watch. It was 2206. If we subtracted a minute for when Sabina first adopted the mischievous expression, the entire village fell still exactly one hour after they went mad. I told Chase we needed sleep. We went back inside. Does this happen every night? I asked Edith. Every night. She repeated. They become rabid for one hour, then go still until sunrise, and then it starts again. July 21, 1945. Chase and I were awake before sunrise. We awaited it from the doorstep of the sister's cottage. The villagers stirred when the first rays appeared over the treetops to the east. One by one, and then all together, they stood up from where they had lain in the street. They resumed walking, crossing paths with one another and exchanging odd pleasantries just as they had been when we arrived the day before. Sabina opened the door and came outside. I stopped her. Sabina, do you know where your children are? She looked at me with the same face as the others and said, they are of the soil. It no longer seemed to bother her. I got out of her way and she walked out to the street. She had been heartbroken the night before. Now her children's fate was of no concern. Captain Perret's squad from the 14th Army arrived at 10.20 hours. I met them in the village center and showed them back to the sister's cottage. There were nine men in all. Perret himself had been in the war since 1942, fighting in Africa, France, and then in the final push into Germany. His next command was First Lieutenant Arizin, who fought in Belgium and Germany. There was also a holy man, Chaplain Sharman. The composition and mission of the squad was a mystery to me. Chase and I explained to Perret everything we had seen in the village thus far. He listened and took everything we said seriously, despite our reports' unusual nature. Perret then posted the rest of his men outside, while he and Arizin briefed us in the cottage. They agreed to allow Edith and Ella to listen in, though as the sisters only spoke German, I couldn't tell how much they absorbed. Perret began. Without specifics, he told us about something called... Operation Overcast. It was an effort by the Allies to acquire top Nazi scientists and engineers 
before the Soviets did. Note from grandson here. Overcast was the program name at the time of my grandfather's writing. Later in 1945, it was renamed Operation Paperclip, which is better known by today. Some of these Nazis were war criminals, but their technical knowledge was considered too important to lose or let fall into communist hands. Parrot Squad was a part of something similar, but different, called Operation Oxcart. Its mission was to investigate the occult elements within the Nazi party, assess them for any real-world utility, and acquire their practitioners and artifacts ahead of the Soviets. They had been hunting Wolfgang Miller since before the war ended. Arizin spread a series of partially redacted papers and charts across the table for us, while Patty talked. The Nazi concept of Aryan superiority is not as simple as you have been told. To the real hardliner Nazis, it has its roots deep in their version of the occult. Now, this isn't Satan and pentagrams. The Nazi occult is something that good men like you and I and the two kind sisters here would otherwise have never heard of. It combines ancient Nordic paganism with something called Theosophy, a pseudo-religion invented by a Russian New Yorker named Helena Blavatsky in the 1870s. They believe human civilization is traced back to what they call the seven root races. First were the Polarians, who didn't have bodies at all. They were supposed to be spirits of pure energy concentrated above the North Magnetic Pole on a continent the ancient Greeks called Hyperborea. The second root race evolved from them, and these Hyperboreans were flesh and blood. They were said to have a thousand year lifespans communicated telepathically, and had eyes set far apart on their heads to see forward and side to side simultaneously, meaning their peripheral vision effectively extended behind. Parrot abruptly stopped. He must have detected the skeptical look I allowed to cross my face. Do I sound like I'm taking this anything but seriously? He asked as he crossed his arms and looked down at me. I was put in charge of this because of my ability to approach any threat with absolute sincerity, no matter how preposterous it may seem. I've seen things you wouldn't even know to have nightmares about, Lieutenant. While we're here, you will take this as seriously as you would a Panzer Division. Is that clear? Yes, Captain. I replied. Arizin chimed in. Hitler may not have believed the occult side of Nazism. But Himmler, Heydrich, Müller, all the top SS guys did. And that's why we can't risk dismissing it. Perit continued. Hyperboreans could physically bond themselves to nature and had no need for solid food. They absorbed what they needed from sunlight, plants, minerals, and water vapor from the air. They reproduced through budding with offspring growing off the body of the parent like a plant. They could even charge the atmosphere through light and vibration and conserve that energy in the underground walls of their temples. A great cataclysm of some kind eventually destroyed Hyperborea, but the survivors became the third root race on a new continent known as Lemuria. They moved south away from the pole, with the Lemurians giving way to the fourth root race, the Atlanteans, and the Atlanteans to the ancestors of modern Europeans. People like Himmler believed us to be in the period of the fifth root race, the Aryans. The SS were supposed to be the purebred genetic and spiritual inheritors of this history, Arizon added. There's a big Nazi book on this called The Myth of the 20th Century by Alfred Rosenberg, and if you want to read it, just don't fucking bother, because we've already spared you the trouble. Despite Lieutenant Arizon's candor, I assure you to take this as seriously as I do. Parrot went on. Men like Himmler and Müller were obsessed with contacting and resurrecting spirits of the Hyperboreans. They saw it as a key to reclaiming their lost heritage, what they call the race soul, which they thought would win them the war and dominate the other races. Himmler intended Wewelsburg Castle to become his Aryan Vatican. It's where you plan to indoctrinate future generations of SS 
and make it the spiritual center of Germany. Miller was to be a major part of this. The legend behind his nickname is clever. Get too close to the solar man and you burn. But the truth goes deeper. The SS claim Miller has an unusually pure strain of Aryan blood. They believe he is a descendant of Hyperborean nobility and that he possesses a clairvoyant memory that allows him to see and experience what his ancestors did hundreds of thousands of years ago. If the SS were planning a ritual to resurrect the Hyperboreans, Muller would have been key to any attempt. His nickname is a tribute to the importance of the sun in Teutonic pagan ceremonies and in Hyperborea, where it stayed above the horizon year-round. Mykon, you said these two women told you the change first came over the village on June 21st. Do you know the significance of that date? No, sir. Parrot gave a knowing look. The 21st was the date of this year's summer solstice. The day when the sun is highest relative to the equator, with the most daylight of the year. I wondered, could Parrot be right about everything? Could Wolfgang Muller have gone to Ewelsburg Castle on the 21st to perform an occult Nazi ritual that was somehow to blame for everything we had seen in the village? and was still hiding in the castle now? I had no other theory of my own. However, part of me questioned some of the facts Pettit presented. While the 21st being the solstice had not occurred to me, I knew enough about basic astronomy to know that the sun was only fully above the horizon at the poles from the spring to fall equinoxes. Not all year. I wondered if Pettit and his squad were taking the idea of Hyperborea too seriously. Parrot then spoke to Edith and Ella in fluent German, surprising us all. I don't know why what's affected the others hasn't affected you, but Muller is as bad as they come. After everything you've been through, the last thing I want is for him to find you. I can arrange to have you taken elsewhere, anywhere you want to go. The sisters shared a look, but didn't need to discuss it. We're staying, said Ella. Edith nodded. We've been told to leave our homes too many times. We're not afraid to stay. Pettit nodded back. While I disagree with your decision, I respect it. It's your right to stay. The briefing ended soon after. Pettit sent a recon team of three men to the castle ahead of the rest. His plan was to breach the castle at 1400 hours. Shays and I were now part of the operation. Our objective was to apprehend Muller and any other SS remnants inside, determine if a ritual to contact the Hyperboreans had been performed, and collect any evidence of it. How can we be so sure what happened to the villagers won't happen to us? I asked Pettit. That's what the good chaplain is for. Chaplain Sharman here is closer to the Lord than any man I know. We were now in the village center with the rest of Pettit's men. Chaplain Sharman put a hand on my shoulder. The god I know would call this root race occultism an abomination. He saw Captain Pettit and I through Morocco, Algeria, D-Day, and the Bulge. He'll see us through this. I noticed the canvas field pack Sharman wore on his back. It wasn't for carrying weapons, and I could tell there was more than just a Bible and food rations inside. I wondered if there was anything Pettit and his men were still keeping from us. The recon team returned shortly after. They reported seeing no SS men or any armaments around the castle. If the SS were inside, they seemingly did not intend to hold it as a defensible position. We moved on the castle at 1400 hours as planned. Pettit and Arizon led us on foot up the tree-covered hill onto a stone bridge that curved left over a dry moat to the entrance on the castle's east wing. The double oak doors had been smashed open when the 83rd rolled through in April, and they remained that way now. We proceeded into the triangular central courtyard with our M1 rifles ready. There were three stories of windows above us, but no movement. We proceeded through a door at the base of the southeast tower. The knob had curiously broken off. Whoever was inside had not bothered to secure it after breaking in. The halls were silent. 
only pair of hooks and nails remained on the walls. There were no tapestries, artworks, or relics. Anything the SS did not remove when they fled ahead of the 83rd had since been taken by the American soldiers or German civilians. Unlike the day before, this day was cloudy with the imminent threat of rain. The electricity had been cut months before, and many of the windows were broken and boarded up. The light became scant, and several of us turned on flashlights. My skin tingled. The air felt thick and produced a subtle thrumming in my ears. Shay said he felt it too. We navigated a sharp corner. Captain, one of Pettit's men in front of me spoke up. Look at this. We all stopped and turned our flashlights at the same point as his. There was a human eyeball embedded in the granite wall. It was aimed along the direction of the wall surface, not facing outward. We looked closer and saw a line of skeleton among the stone blocks. It looked as if bone and stone had combined into one, as if the whole human had sunk into the wall and all the tissue disintegrated leaving only the silhouette of its skeleton and an eyeball. I stepped back from it as Arizin crouched to look more closely. Arizin followed the lines of the skeleton with his light. He was running when it happened. The bastard was trying to escape. He said. Then I saw it. The lines in the stone showed a skeleton in mid-sprint, frozen in stone in a flash. Shit! exclaimed one of the men, immediately hushing his voice. The eye moved. We all watched it. The eye in the wall twitched, and its iris pointed at us. I saw something else between the stones. Something pink and flailing. A human tongue moving back and forth. Then, we heard a scream. It was a male voice in despair and agony. It came from no one direction, but from all around us, unlike the screams of the dying I had heard on the front. The tongue turned to sand, breaking apart onto the floor, and the eyeball hardened until the wall consumed it fully. Perret had said in his briefing that Hyperboreans could physically bond themselves to nature. I wondered if a spirit of one had done so to this man, a likely an SS officer and bonded him to the minerals in the wall. It was very much like what I had seen in some of the villagers. One of the men photographed it, and we continued. Our squad proceeded up a staircase and back down another dark corridor. There were no sounds of the living, only more of the unpleasant thrumming sound. We cased the long east wing back and forth, down the length of the corridor on each floor entering each rooms and working our way up from the second floor to the third. We found spent bullet cartridges, trash, burnt, papers and broken furniture, but nothing that pointed to an occult ritual. The thrumming came and went, but each time it returned, the sound grew more precise. Eventually, it sounded like a baritone voice, speaking strange single syllables I cannot describe. The voice came from no particular direction or source. It was all around us, wherever we went. At the end of the corridor on the third floor, we entered the North Tower. The towers were circular, and the North Tower was the widest of the three. We passed through an antechamber and into what Pettit called the General's Hall. The thrumming voice ceased when we entered. This large room was brighter, with twelve narrow windows spaced between twelve columns encircling the round hall. The floor and ceiling were smooth marble, not the rough stone of the rest of the castle. In the center of the floor was a strange design. There was a large black ring ten feet in diameter, connected to two smaller black circles at its center by twelve jagged lines. I knew these jagged lines to be Germanic sick runes. When two of these runes were paired, they formed the dreaded double lightning bolt symbol of the SS. The Black Sun, said Pettit. This is where they would have met had they won the war, gentlemen. It looked the part of an Aryan Vatican, 
somewhere for Heinrich Himmler and the SS generals to gather and plot. We kept looking and went down a spiral stairwell into the castle's crypt. It was under a 30 foot high dome ceiling with eight slanted alcoves carved out of it. At the top of the ceiling was an ornate swastika sculpted to mirror the black sun on the floor of the general's hall directly above it. In the center of the floor was an unlit, circular fire pit ringed by a curving concrete pedestal. Twelve smaller stone pedestals surrounded the crypt along the wall. We had to be at least one or two stories on the ground, but the height of the ceiling made it hard to tell. There was a large bronze urn beside the fire pit, filled to the brim with silver. Totem cop rings, I said to the group as I removed a handful of the silver rings. They were engraved with Nazi symbols. Each one had a totem cop, the death head skull, as well as double sick runes and a swastika. There could be a thousand of them. Grandson again here, as of 2023. No one, including the US Army, knows the location of the over 14,500 totem cuff rings made in Nazi Germany. Himmler reportedly ordered they all be entombed inside a mountain near Wewelsburg, but they have never been found. If his account is true, my grandfather may have been the last person alive to see them. Pettit examined one. Gerhard Gorman, 27 August 1937. They have the wearer's name and the date the ring was awarded on the inside. He said, The 83rd must have taken these. Muller must have brought them with him. The thrumming voice returned. The syllables were crispier now. Though it was not a language any of us had ever heard. We noticed something else about it. We were in a tall, domed chamber. Yet... There was no echo. Several of us remarked on it. Captain Pettit? Chase spoke up. I think I know where the voice is coming from. Go on, Corporal, said Pettit. I hear it in my right ear just as well as my left, but I went deaf in my right ear when my platoon was shelled a year ago. It's not a sound at all. That's why there's no echo. You said the Hyperboreans communicated telepathically? It's in our heads, sir. The chilling effect on the rest of us was instant. We shared uncertain looks, each of us thinking versions of the same thought. If it was speaking into our minds, what else might it do to us? We had all seen what happened to many of the villagers. But for the first time, I was afraid for myself. Any advice, chaplain? I asked Charmin. The Lord guided us here for a reason. He guided you to the sisters and guided us to you. He hasn't let anything harm us yet. He quoted something from the Bible. Fear not, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Pettit told us to keep moving. Our objective was still to locate Muller, and we had more of the castle to search. We went back up the spiral staircase and checked up and down the corridors of the west wing. We found strange mounds of dirt and rock. We found a large growth of moss in the rough shape of a human body stretched across the floor, as if the man it used to be was crawling away, desperate to escape his fate. We found six such oddities in all. The seeming remains of men that had been reduced to the elements. There were surely more to be found in the rest of the castle, and our chances of finding Muller dwindled. But then, in another dark spiral stairwell between the second and third floors of the southwest tower, he found us. Parrot held up his hand. We all stopped. Arizon moved up beside him and the rest of us fell in line behind him. We heard footsteps above us, the kind made by combat boots. A voice spoke to us in German from around the curve of the stairwell. Welcome to the center of the past and future world. It said slowly in a tone that sounded like a very loud and harsh whisper. Oberfuhrer Miller, we have retaken the castle. 
I have the men and guns to apprehend you and any men you have left. Petit said back in German. You are Americans, the hissing voice said in English. Your accent is like sandpaper to my ears. I could tell you the same. I'm Captain Pettit of the United States Army. The war's over. Let's not make this bloodier than it has to be. We heard the footsteps coming closer. I tightened my grip on the M1. Then, we saw him. Wolfgang Miller came around the curve of the wall. He was unarmed with his palms open at his sides. But I gulped when I saw him. He was shirtless and his body strong and lean. But on his chest was a tattoo of the black sun from the general's hall. And on his face was a pagan mask. There was a faceplate made from an animal skull rimmed with fur and straw. Sprouting from the top on one side was an antler and from the other side a jagged tree branch. I could not see his eyes through the shadows. I offer you my surrender, Captain, Miller said. But first, there is much you will wish to see. By this point in my grandfather's journal, I had clearer insight into his mind than I ever had growing up. As close as my bond with him was, as generous and wise as he was, something about him was always opaque. Looking back on the man now, I might finally know why. His experience in Wewelsburg changed what he understood about the world and the human race's place in it for the rest of his life. No one else he knew or would meet was going to share that understanding. Despite the large, extended family he eventually had, in a way, it must have made him a very lonely man. I had to read further to learn what he knew about the Hyperboreans, and to what extent they were real or not. It was something I certainly never heard of. Also telling was the lack of information available on Captain Pettit and Operation Oxcart. Operation Paperclip was declassified decades ago, so why not Oxcart? I discovered that Oxcart was later reused for the name of the program that developed the A-12 and SR-71 spy planes. Did the United States government paper over an operation to utilize a Nazi occult with another classified program? And if so, what did they want to hide? From the Journal of Jack Mikan, 2nd Lieutenant, United States Army, 4th Infantry Division, July 21, 1945. Padded in arrows and handcuffed Miller's arms behind his back. Miller did not resist. He insisted on taking us up to a chamber on the 5th floor of the Southwest Tower. Padded went up first leading the way with his M1 ready. Arizin and I followed behind them, bookending Miller between us. I kept my Smith & Wesson revolver trained on him in case he tried anything. I was afraid of him after everything I had heard about the Solar Men since I first stepped foot in Germany a year ago. That was before I had ever heard the word Hyperborean. Now, I wasn't just afraid, I was terrified. I don't know why Pettit let him keep the pagan mask on. Despite his confident demeanor, maybe even the captain feared removing it. Muller had another tattoo, this one down the middle of his back. It looked like a tree trunk with two cross pieces atop it that could have been leaves, wings, or the hilt guard of an ornamental dagger. The Nazis abhorred tattoos. I wondered why Muller was different. The South Tower was not as wide as the North Tower with its crypt and General's Hall. Miller's chamber at the top of it was a barren circular room with four small windows. By 1620 hours, storm clouds had darkened the sky. We set Miller down on the floor in the center. Several of us surrounded Miller while Arizin took others back downstairs to search the remaining chambers and corridors. Pettit examined Muller's few belongings. 
There was a simple cart, a leather carry bag, a stack of Wehrmacht field rations, and a pile of strange old and new books. There was a ceremonial SS dagger and a Walter P-38 pistol. Pettit picked up the gun and ejected the magazine. It was loaded, but Miller had chosen not to use it. Miller's eyes stared up at me through the holes of his mask. I don't know what I expected, but they were merely human. Pettit crouched in front of Miller. A lot of men have been after you for a long time, Wolfgang. But now I have you. I don't know how much you've hurt, but everyone who mattered to you is finished. Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, Det, Goering, Dunitz, Cairo, Jodl, Speer, Kaltenbrunner, Hess, all in our custody. Surrendering was the right call. This is where it all ends for you. What I'll determine is how. You can be either useful to us, or you can join the rest of them. I know all about what this castle was planned to be for the SS. What are you doing back in Wewelsburg? The mask tilted sideways, while Miller studied padded back. Men can be finished, but a movement never dies. To the Führer, National Socialism was only a political movement. He was mistaken. It is far, far more than that. It is a spiritual movement. I'm here to complete it. What do you mean? The war took time and resources away from our research at Wewelsburg. Had it not, we would have accomplished what I'm doing now years ago. Pettit smirked. You don't expect me to believe you were against the war, do you? Of course not. The war was necessary. But it is a paradox that fighting it ensured we could not accomplish the true spiritual goal. You came back to perform a ritual, didn't you? Pettit picked up several of the books. See, I've read these two. Rosenberg, Von List, Blavatsky. I know what you're trying to do. That's what this mask is for. What happens if I remove it? Miller cocked his head again. I would remove it for you, if it were not for these handcuffs. And we can't have that now, can we? said Pettit. He took the mask in both hands and lifted it from Miller's head. The most striking thing about his face was how forgettable it was. While a stereotypical Aryan in every way, there was nothing about his eyes, nose, or jaw to distinguish him. It was the look of a German everyman who would disappear in a crowd, if not for his height and build. One expects to feel something cold when confronted with the face of evil. But in Wolfgang Miller, I felt nothing at all. Pettit passed the mask to Chaplain Charman. Disappointed, Captain? Asked Muller. You expected a monster? Beware they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Quoted Charman. Arizin returned, holding something in each hand. We found these, he said, placing them on the floor in front of Pettit. The first object was another pagan mask, similar to but different from Miller's. There are eleven more, just like his. And then there's this. He notched the second object with his foot. It was a solid gold cauldron twenty inches across and twelve inches deep. It had human-like faces as well as trees and strange animals forged into it. Pettit and his men traded knowing glances. It seemed they knew what it was, while Chase and I did not. Miller stared at it, bittersweet. You and your men tried to contact spirits of the Hyperboreans, didn't you? But something went wrong. Pettit continued. We found your men, and they were in bad shape. What happened, Miller? Miller spoke, taking turns, looking each of us in the eye. There is so much you Christian men do not understand. Christianity is an evil arisen from Judaism that reduced we Aryans to slaves and made us weak and docile. 
I have knowledge. Memories of my Teutonic and Saxon ancestors. I was there when the Christian king Charlemagne drove them from their homes and destroyed their customs. Now their cross, the great Irmin soul, the blood and soil cross which I wear upon my back, will topple the crisis cross again as the German people rediscover the pagan gods the church suppressed. I was there in Hyperborea before the eye swallowed it. The Hyperboreans perceived the natural truths of the universe and took their wellness from the elements of the earth. I have their memories too. Memories of a people in perpetual gladness and contentment in a place where the sun did not set and nourished the land all year. You're wrong, I interjected, taking the others by surprise. The place you speak of is impossible. I know a thing or two about astronomy. The sun doesn't set at the poles, only between the spring and fall equinoxes. It's below the horizon for half a year. Miller smiled, and then let it gradually fade. No, Lieutenant, it's you who are wrong, as all of these men will now learn. When the sun falls below the horizon, it begins the period of astronomical twilight. The sun may be hidden, but its rays nourished the polar sky yet. Until November, until astronomical dusk when it reaches 18 degrees beneath the horizon, the continent saw but 77 days of night when the Hyperboreans slept until astronomical dawn in January. I had no response. I felt discredited and humiliated in front of the other soldiers. How could I let a murderous SS war criminal lecture me like that? Pettit and his men stood and listened. Rebuking Miller didn't help their mission. They were here to study him. Miller pontificated on how ancient Greek philosophers Hesiod, Herodotus, and Pindar wrote about Hyperborea in the 7th and 5th century BC. He invoked Pliny the Elder, who referred to it as the land beyond the north wind. Miller took great satisfaction in demonstrating the terrifying breadth of his knowledge. He referenced John Sylvain Bailey, a French mathematician and astronomer I had never heard of who linked Hyperborea through Atlantis to classical Europe by the process of diffusionism where all technology and customs shared a common origin and spread outward. With the destruction of the rest of the Nazis, Muller believed he alone was on the cusp of bringing on a supernatural revelation that would possess the German people and transform society into a monolithic, eternal structure. It started to rain. Wind and water began to batter the castle. Muller's voice grew bold and throatier, and the sense of dread he instilled in me grew worse. During the Ice Age, the Aryan built his natural and bodily strength in the hard fight against nature, arising differently than other races who lived without this bountiful struggle. We know all these people, from Hyperboreans to the Tetons, held one sign in common. The symbol of the sun. Their societies were built on light. Human culture and civilization are inseparably bound with the presence of the Aryan. If he dies or declines, the dark veils of an age without culture will descend on this globe. It was appalling and terrifying and became hard to listen to. Pettit told Arizin and I to come down to the floor below with him. What do you think? Pettit asked. He's a zealot, said Arizin. A staunch Nazi to the end. I think seeing everything he worked for destroyed did something to him. He's not right in the head, even for one of them, wearing that mask around like that. Having nothing left only made him double down. I made us all look weak in front of him. I'm sorry, Captain, I said. Arizon looked me in the eye. We won the fucking war. He lost. Mikan, do you connect anything he said with what you saw in the villagers? Pettit asked. Miller's talk about the sun and the earth's elements could explain the physical deformities some of the villagers have. If they're actually becoming the nature around them. He said the Hyperboreans were perpetually glad and content. That's just how the villagers act. They're deteriorating and changing. But all they can say is how well they are. 
I paused and thought back. The only time when they didn't was when one of the women, Sabina, cried for her missing children. She was distraught and coherent, but only briefly, when the sunlight was gone. It all began to come together for me. That's what Muller said too. Hyperborea was only dark for 77 days after astronomical dusk. The villagers went mad and fell asleep once the sun was 18 degrees below the horizon. When we isolated Sabina from the rest, she briefly became sane at astronomical dusk. I've heard enough to come up with a theory, said Pettit. Chaplain? He shouted up the stairwell. Charmin came down and joined us. Petta told him, Show Lieutenant Mike what's in your pack. Charmin took the canvas field pack off his shoulder. From inside, he removed a second metal cauldron nearly identical to the gold one Arizon found in the castle. This one was made of silver and showed heavy signs of wear. It had the same strange faces and iconography, but was clearly much older. Charmin explained it to me. This is the Gundestrup cauldron, made in the Iron Age around 300 BC by the Celts, or another ancient Teutonic people who used it for ritualistic practices. It was discovered in a peat buck in Denmark in 1891. The Danes kept it out of the Nazis' hands once they learned Heinrich Himmler was looking for it. The gold cauldron used upstairs is a near reproduction forged by a German metallurgist named Otto Gar. Himmler couldn't get his hands on the real thing, so he settled for a replica. Unfortunately for him and Miller, it didn't work, said Pettit. The SS was unable to finish their plans for the castle before the war ended. What I propose is that Miller located the car cauldron and brought it back to Wewelsburg Castle with him. Then on June 21st, the day of the summer solstice, he and his men performed a pagan ritual to contact spirits of the Hyperboreans. But without the Gundestrap cauldron, the real one, something went wrong. Instead of resurrecting a Hyperborean, containing it, and communicating with it, the spirit of one was released and went on to plague all the people living in the surrounding village. It infested in them like witchcraft, said Arizon. But not the Jewish sisters, I added. Edith and Ella weren't affected. Maybe the Hyperboreans can only connect to those with Aryan blood, said Pettit. What about Miller? It harmed this man worst of all. Why would it leave him untouched? I asked. Any ideas, Chaplain? Asked Pettit. Charmin thought about it. Not to equate a Hyperborean with the Lord, but God often spared chosen men while afflicting entire tribes around them. If the Hyperboreans were real, perhaps they still need him for something. And by this point, I was desperate to be done in Wewelsburg. I had followed my orders to investigate the village and report what I found to my general, who placed the situation in more capable hands. I was in over my head, and I wanted to leave. What now, Captain? Are you going to take Muller in for war crimes charges? I asked. That isn't my objective, Lieutenant, said Pettit. My orders are to determine if there are real-world applications for the Nazi occult before the Soviets do. We have the Gundestrap cauldron, and we have Miller. I'm going to make him perform the ritual again. Captain Pettit organized the rest of his men and informed them of the plan to repeat the ritual to contact the Hyperboreans. I formally requested he allow Chase and I to leave and return to our unit. Pettit denied it. He did agree to my second idea. Everyone in Pettit's squad seemed confident that nothing would happen with them with Chaplain Charman there. Chase and I were less confident. The others had not seen the villagers to the extent we had. I proposed we allow Edith and Ella to come into the castle. They had been immune to the effects of the first attempted ritual. I would never ask them to actually participate. But I thought they could monitor us from outside the crypt, if they were willing. At 2040 hours, I drove through the pouring rain with Chase to the sister's cottage. 
Countless villagers were out in the streets, behaving just as they had before their rabbit panic on our first night in Wewelsburg. They gathered in masses, all facing the waning twilight to the west, indifferent to the rain. It was about 25 minutes until dusk. We parked at the cottage, just as Ella ran out the front door carrying a basket covered from the rain by a tarp. She stopped when she saw the car. What is it, Ella? Where's your sister? I asked. Her demeanor was flustered, her tone grim. It's Margaret. Her baby is coming. Edith is with her. I ran home to get supplies. I saw it was urgent. Get in. I'll take you, I told her. Chase helped Ella into the car. I explained to him in English. Margaret is the woman with the fetus budding outside her body. The one with the tree branch growing through her insides. It was the last thing we needed to be concerned with right now. But Chase and I both felt the responsibility to help, if we even could. Edith was surprised to see us when we entered Margaret's cottage. I didn't want to tell them about the upcoming ritual just yet. Margaret was in the midst of the strangest labor anyone had ever witnessed or heard of. The fetus had grown visibly since I had last seen it, just one day ago. It was writhing inside the thick, translucent layer of veiny skin, growing like a seed pot from its mother's abdomen. A small tear was forming in the skin pot, and a trickle of greenish fluid leaked onto the floor. Margaret herself was clearly in pain, though unable to speak or even move due to the branch growing down her throat and out her rear. Her eyes rolled back in her head while she gagged and twitched. This is what we're supposed to help that Nazi bastard resurrect? This is what Padded wants to get before the Soviets so badly? Chase lamented. I couldn't help but agree. I feared neither Muller nor Padded, nor any of us understood what we were meddling with. But right now, none of that was our concern. I brought scissors, a knife, bandages, needles, thread, and clean blankets. Ella told Edith, emptying the basket onto the table. What do we do? I asked Edith. I don't know, she replied, picking up the scissors and eyeing the growing tear in the skin pot. Margaret kicked her legs and tried to turn her body. Her eyes rolled forward toward the door. Hold her still. She wants to go in the street with the others, said Ella. Chase checked his watch. Two minutes to dusk. I relayed it to the sisters in German. We didn't know what would happen if it couldn't, but we all sensed the baby needed to come out before the villagers erupted in their nightly panic. Margaret kicked and moved again. I held her legs down while Ella and Chase grabbed her arms and torso. She'll die if that branch breaks inside of her, I realized aloud. I'm going to try to cut the baby out, said Edith. We kept Margaret as still as we could while Edith gently inserted the scissors into the tear and slowly cut. More clear greenish liquid spilled out. Then, Margaret's own blood from the splitting skin. You're cutting too deep, Ella said, worried. I don't know what else to do, said Edith. None of us did. She cut along the length of the skin pot, bit by bit. Had we not needed to restrain Margaret, Perhaps we could have cleaned the wound and stemmed the bleeding, but Edith's forearms were soon awash with a mix of blood and green liquid. Then, suddenly, she reached inside the pot. I have the baby's head, Edith announced. I'm going to pull it out. I clenched my teeth as I watched Edith's hands move beneath the skin and grabbed the baby's shoulders. Margaret suddenly stopped moving. I couldn't tell if she was still breathing. Edith sat down and eased the baby out of the skin pot, her clothes now covered in the pot's fluid. Then, the baby was out. It was a male. There was no umbilical cord. It was also completely silent. I thought it was dead at first. I think we all feared that. But then I saw it breathing. Its mouth opened and its arms and legs moved, but it didn't cry. 
The silence of that moment was eerie in a different manner from everything else we had witnessed. Ella tried the baby off and wrapped it in a blanket. Edith lay down on the floor, relieved and exhausted. Then we heard the screams. The villagers outside shrieked and moaned. We saw their shadowy silhouettes out the window, running amok in the street. Dusk had fallen on Vavelsburg once again. Then, Margaret lurched, and we heard a sharp crack. The branch growing through Margaret's body had snapped. It startled all of us. Her teeth bit into the bark, and her limbs spasmed and went still. Blood began pulling in her cheek and dribbling out the corner of her mouth. More trickled down the vine at the end of the branch, growing out of her other end. None of us spoke. We washed up and gathered a short while later. Ella swaddled the baby, who was still eerily quiet. Edith had changed clothes. Shays and I were now late getting back to the castle. I didn't know what kind of reaction to expect from the sisters when I asked them about returning there with us. Ella especially was unsettled by the idea. I repeated that I was not in any way forcing or guilting them to comply. I said if they chose not to, I would drive away and none of us would ask them again. I even told them that after it was over, I would guarantee an army doctor would come to help the villagers. I knew only one of them could come. One had to stay with the baby. Ella chose to stay behind, while Edith agreed to come with us. Ella pleaded with her not to, but Edith was committed. Maybe she appreciated my kindness, or she felt indebted to the US Army for liberating Buchenwald and ridding them of the Nazis. Maybe she worried my promise to send a doctor was contingent on her agreement, despite my insistence that it wasn't. Regardless, she hugged Ella goodbye and got into the car. Vavelsburg Castle awaited us. My grandfather's journal demonstrated how as a young man, he was not yet the hardened, unperturbable elder I knew. He was still in his twenties at the time he wrote it. But what I found most telling was that the war itself seemed not to be the transformative event for him. It was Vivelsburg. Fighting the Nazis had certainly made a capable man out of him. But whatever happened in that village and in that castle affected him more profoundly. It scared him in a way that Battlefield never had. Reading the journal also allowed me a window into his conscience. While he didn't state it directly, I sensed him weighing a heavy ethical question as he listened to the things Miller said and he prepared to go into the ritual. Was this the burden no one else will understand my grandfather warns me about when I was a teenager? I needed to know. From the Journal of Jack Mikan, 2nd Lieutenant, United States Army, 4th Infantry Division, July 21, 1945. Everything was ready at Vavelsburg Castle by 2200 hours, but the rain clouds that blotted out the stars looked to linger into the night. Miller was still handcuffed when we walked him from his chamber in the Southwest Tower to the General's Hall in the North Tower. Pettit's men had already prepared everything as Miller instructed. The Gundestrap cauldron, the authentic, the silver one was at the center of the black sun symbol on the floor. Beside it was the text of the ritual itself, printed into an official Nazi party book with a solid wooden cover featuring the black sun on the front and double sick runes on the back. The book was intended to look old, but like the gold cauldron, it was entirely of modern construction. Arranged around the silver cauldron were four more items found elsewhere in the castle. A wooden crate, a wooden spear with a metal plate, and a pair of swords. The old-looking weapons were of unknown vintage. Flames flickered from small torches mounted to each of the twelve pillars around the circular hall. Unbeknownst to Miller, Edith was in the corridor outside the room. Unbeknownst to Pettit, she was armed with my Smith & Wesson revolver. 
Pettit unlocked Miller's handcuffs. You are making a wise decision, Captain Pettit, Miller said, stretching his arms and cracking his neck. When this is over, even you will understand what we Germans were so close to accomplishing. Pettit did not react. You're sure you don't need the sun for this? Muller gave a knowing grin. We did, but not anymore. Have your men stand between each pillar. That space is mine. He pointed to the space between the two pillars at the northmost point of the room. Do as he says, Pettit instructed. Chase and I followed Arizin, Charmin, and the rest of Pettit's squad. Muller spoke once we were in place. There are eleven of you. With me, twelve. It is fitting this is the exact number required. This was faded. He opened the crate and held up a smoothed, varnished tree branch slightly over a foot in length. Then he held up a flat stone engraved with a Germanic rune. There were eleven of each, all with different runes, and he handed them to each of us. He then took his spot between the two remaining pillars. When I salute, strike the rune stone with the branch six times. Like this. He struck the stone in his hand with the blunt end of a branch six evenly spaced times. He handed the stone and branch to Pettit. Then Miller lifted the book. I will read from the Nazis Boreas, translated to German from Old Norse. Before I begin the reading, two of you must cross the pair of swords over the spear of Wotan. Some of us flinched as Miller picked up the spear, but he merely walked back to his place between the two open pillars. Mikan, Pettit said, nodding at the swords. He and I picked them up from the center of the room and walked up to Miller. He lifted the spear with the blade pointed at the ceiling. Pettit placed one sword across it and I the other. Miller began in English. The flame of the resurrection of the polar and spiritual north. The flame of the Hyperborean will transform civilizational reality. It will be the final restoration, putting an end to the history of false civilizations. The final victory will grant spiritual abundance, and will see a lost continent rise out of the abysses of the past. A spiritual continent will reappear in the world of men, and a new age on earth will dawn. Arians, return your swords to the Black Sun. Pettit and I set them down in the center and went back to our places around the room. Miller laid down the spear and opened the book, switching to German. Ancestors, I have tidings with you. The wolf howls, summer thaws, winter has gone, the wind is low, the sun is high, its course is long, the sea runs strongly. Then, he made a Nazi salute. We looked at one another. Uncomfortable. But then, as if all of us suddenly understood, we raised our blunt, varnished branches and struck our own stones six times. It produced a series of loud, hollow echoes in the circular hall. Miller continued. These are my tidings. Blood up to heaven, heaven down to earth. A cup full of earth, meat in abundance. The roots are bountiful, season of sun. These are my tidings. He saluted again, and we struck the rune stones. Power of the raven be thine, power of the eagle be thine, power of the storm be thine, power of the moon be thine, power of the sun be thine, power of the sea, power of the land, power of the blood, power of heaven. He saluted. We struck. The echoes seemed to persist longer each time, making the flames from the torches blow and flicker. The ritual continued like this for some time. I didn't know how long I expected it to take for a spirit to appear, but it evidently would not come quickly. Finally, Miller closed the book. Captain, have your men take their torches and follow me. They may leave the rune stones here. Do it, said Pettit. We set down the stones and branches and lifted the torches from their mounts on the columns. 
Then, we followed Miller single file down the spiral staircase to the crypt. Miller carried the Gundus trap cauldron himself. We descended beneath the crypt's 30 foot high dome ceiling. I looked up at the ornate swastika sculpted at the top of it. I felt a sense of shame for what I was participating in. Yet, also a begrudging responsibility to root out what this ritual was before it potentially caused more harm than it already had. Miller set the cauldron on the concrete pedestal, wringing the cold fire pit across from the urn containing the silver totem cuff rings. There were three bronze bowls, one containing a mount of dirt and another holding pine needles. The third bowl was empty, and beside it, a ceremonial SS dagger. Together, the cauldron, the urn, and the three bowls were placed equal distances from each other in a circle around the pit. On the twelve smaller pedestals around the wall were twelve pagan ritual masks made from bone, wood, straw, branches, antlers, and wolves or boar's fur. They were all variation of the mask Muller wore when we found them. Rough sticks and tree branches surrounded the fire pit and curved pedestal in an outer concentric ring. Miller told us to don the masks. Mine fit snugly around my face. I don't know what I expected to happen, but when I looked at the shrouded faces of the soldiers around me, I lost all sense of them as men. I did not make a note of who stood where before we put them on. Now, aside from Miller, I didn't know who anyone was. I realized that was the mask's very purpose. He had us pick up the branches and sticks and lay them atop the cold pit in the crypt center. We each held our torches to the branches until a large fire blazed in the pit. We returned to our places at the twelve outer pedestals. Miller stayed by the curved pedestal and slit his palm with the ceremonial dagger. He squeezed his hand into a fist and leaked blood into the empty bronze bowl. He instructed us to do the same starting in a counterclockwise order around the room. I was next to last. The mask's eye holes forced me to focus only on what was directly in front of me. And so when my turn came, I stalled, holding the dagger. Without considering why, I slit my palm, but did not squeeze blood into the bowl. I did it discreetly so no one would see. Once we all had bled and taken our places along the wall, Miller returned to the center. He took a handful of dirt from the first bowl and dropped it into the cauldron. Then, he took a handful of pine needles from the next bowl and dropped it into the cauldron as well. He poured the bowl of blood into the cauldron last. Miller read in German from the book by firelight. The Brecken is red. Its shape has been hidden. The sun has freed the wings of birds. Season of water, season of fire, season of green, season of fruit. These are my tidings. I call upon the powers that exist in the land, sea, and sky. I call upon you at the peak of the year. He waved a hand slowly back and forth over the urn of totem golf rings. Let our dead be remembered. Let them find a place at our table. Let them find vitality and ire in our remembering. Miller's voice gradually lowered in volume, until it was barely above a whisper. I had to concentrate to hear him. Hear us, ancestors and honored dead. We have made our offerings. We have spoken our tidings. Remember us. Watch over us. Through the light of the year. In the dark. By then, I could no longer hear him. We heard only the crackling of flames. Then, a low thrumming that grew steadily louder. I watched the man's masked heads looked up and around as the thrumming telepathic voice returned. The single syllables began to run together. It wasn't German, nor was it English. It was a language I had never heard at all. One of the eight alcoves in the dome ceiling surrounding the ornate swastika flashed. Then another. Then two more. And three more. 
The alcoves glowed on and off at intervals. The shifting light and dark became disorienting. When lit, they were like windows to the outside at midday. But they were not windows, and the night by then was dark. I felt heat radiating down at me. It felt different from the heat of the fire. It felt like the sun. I recalled in Pettit's briefing how he said the Hyperboreans could conserve light energy and store it within their granite temples. I wondered, had Miller turned the castle crypt into a form of Hyperborean battery? The orange flames in the fire pit suddenly extinguished. The pine, soil, and blood mixture in the cauldron gave off fumes, then a thick smoke and a bright white flame. The light from the alcoves went dark and the thrumming voice ceased. The white flame burned until it consumed the mixture in the cauldron and extinguished. The crypt was now completely dark. If the other man felt as I did, then we were all nervous but too afraid to move. I heard Miller's voice again, coming from near the cauldron. The circle is unbroken. The ancestors awoken. Hail to the ice and the soil. Hail to the root and the branch. Tooth and claw, fur and feather. Of earth, sky, and sun. Then he stopped. The crypt was silent. Then, I heard the sound of a body landing on the stone floor. I waited to see if Captain Pettit took any action. When he didn't, I turned on a small flashlight I kept on my belt and proceeded carefully toward the center. Who is that? What are you doing? I heard Pettit's voice say from across the room. I shined my small beam of light on Miller. He had fallen on his back. His mask was still on, and I saw his bare chest rising and falling. I removed my mask, and then his. I gasped when I saw his face. He looked afraid and distraught. His eyes were white with terror. They're not, they're not what we thought. His voice trembled in German. I'm lost, I'm damned. If only, if only I could, if... He stopped speaking, and his chest stopped moving. Another man rushed over to me and took off his mask. It was Chase. What happened to him? He asked. I don't know. He was about to say. I stopped myself. Something was happening to Miller's face. He lifted his head and focused his eyes upward. His lip quivered and his nostrils flared. He gritted his teeth and his mouth formed a familiar expression that was truly chilling. He looks just like Sabina, Chase remarked. He was right. It was the same look. A frozen grin that bared all of his teeth while his eyes gazed upward, as if staring at something invisible to us and knowing something we did not. Padded and Arizon dropped their masks and hurried over. What happened? Did it work or not? Arizon asked. I saw his lips moving. What did he say to you, Mikan? Asked Padded, pointing another flashlight. I had to think. He said, they're not what we thought. Pettit was frustrated. What does that mean? What who thought? Them? We have to snap him out of it. Maybe we can. He stopped, and we all looked down. Miller's grin had disappeared. And then Miller sat bolt upright at the waist, and belted out a wailing moaning scream that rattled our eardrums and echoed off the walls and dome. The other scrambled away. I covered my ears and stepped back as Miller stood up. The scream did not cease. A brutal wind picked up inside, seeming to come from Miller himself. The alcoves lit up like flash bulbs in an effect that was almost blinding. I shielded my eyes and backpedaled away from Miller. I saw a change in his eyes, like the human light in them had gone out, and another had come in. The whites of his eyes glowed bright, and there was another glow deep in his throat as the scream persisted. 
There was nothing human about him now. It was like a freak storm had entered the crypt. The wind hurled branches, dirt, pine needles, and embers from the fire pit around like a cyclone. The rest of the men tore off their masks and huddled for cover on the ground. The Hyperborean, it no longer fit to call him Miller, wailed and cried out. Tears streamed down its face, and it grabbed its head in agony. It bumped into walls and knocked over the urn, spilling the totem golf rings, which were then hurled around by the cyclone winds, striking me like projectiles and cutting my skin. While this was happening, the telepathic voice thrummed inside my head. I couldn't tell just yet, but the thoughts the Hyperborean projected began to resemble English. I yelled for Shays. Together, I hoped he and I could escape. I spotted him across the room, but tripped over one of the other soldiers, who was trapped on the floor with branches grafted to his back and hit. Help me! Help me! The soldier begged as the branch sprouted twigs that grew out from his mouth and pushed out his eyeballs. He dropped dead on the floor before I could do anything. I stood up and tried to reach Chase again. But it was already too late. He had ducked for cover against the wall. But now, the wall had bonded itself to him. His face was half embedded in a granite. I saw his eyes point toward me. Blood leaked out from under his eyelid and nostrils. Blood that immediately turned to sand. Chase was gone. I feared I didn't have long. I saw Charmin facing the Hyperborean. He shouted Bible verses to no effect as glowing embers repeatedly stuck to his body. I shielded my face from the projectiles and wind and hid it for the spiral staircase. I looked up the instant the alcoves flashed again, blinding me momentarily. Once I could see, Parrot was in front of me. Pine needles were sprouting from under his skin, piercing out through his pores. I'm sorry, Lieutenant, he said shamefully, with needles growing even out of his tongue. Padded collapsed, and blood pulled around him. I had almost made it to the stairs, when a voice in English and clear as day entered my head. Turn around, Jack, it said. I shuddered and looked behind me. The Hyperborean was there. It no longer resembled Miller at all. It was misshapen, like Miller's skeleton was stretching and breaking apart, trying to take on a new form. Its screaming had stopped. All I heard in my ears was the battering wind. But in my head, I heard its voice. Why did you bring me back? It asked. I don't know, I said aloud, uncertain if needed to or if it would simply read my thoughts. I'm hurting people. I don't belong, it said. Are you going to hurt me? It held out its hand and looked at it. I looked at my own palm. I hadn't added my blood to the others. Is that why not? I asked. It didn't answer directly. We had our age. Long ago. This world now. It would be better if... It forgot us again. I tried to understand. Are you still Wolfgang Miller? I am him. And I am not. Being right about us does not make him right. I try to think about what it meant. Then, the loud crack of a gunshot broke through the howl of the wind. Edith stood behind me at the bottom of the spiral staircase, trembling, holding my Smith and Wesson in both hands with her arms outstretched. I looked back at the Hyperborean. In its chest was a bleeding bullet hole, and on its face was the same idyllic, closed smile I had seen in the villagers when I arrived in Vivalsburg. The Hyperborean, Miller, whatever it was now, 
fell to its knees and slumped over onto the floor. The wind died. And the cacophony stopped. I tried to follow Edith up the stairs, but I could barely walk. Being near the Hyperborean had trained me. She must have dragged me out of the castle as I awoke outside some hours later, having passed out in the wake of the terrible ordeal. From the Journal of Jack Mikan, First Lieutenant, United States Army, Retired, Addendum, May 1, 1991. I never received an official debrief after leaving Vavilsburg. Major General Barton informed me that as far as the U.S. Army was concerned, Captain Pettit, Lieutenant Arizon, Corporal Chase, Chaplain Charman, and six others were killed in action, driving an SS remnant out of the castle. Anyone in the federal government orchestrating operating Oxcart never spoke with me. Anything I could have told the press would have sounded too preposterous to believe. Perhaps it was cleaner and simpler for the government to ignore me and disavow anything I might say. I filed an official request to send a doctor, a rabbi, and a priest to the Vavilsburg villagers. But I don't know if it was ever fulfilled. Edith and Ella may have lived out their days, thinking I abandoned them after I promised them I wouldn't. I hope they and the others received the help they needed. I did not return to Germany until after the post-Soviet reunification. I ventured back to Wavelsburg when I did. The castle had been restored, and the town around it, while still small, had grown. I met no residents who still knew of the sisters, and no one had ever even heard the word Hyperborean. Final note from Jack's grandson. My grandfather's burden is clear to me now. If what he wrote is true, then everything we've been taught about human evolution and the development of civilization is wrong. Again, he was not an attention seeker and had nothing to gain by writing this account and sitting on it for nearly 80 years. If posting this here gains any sort of traction at all, then the scientific community and historians will be the first to dismiss and criticize it. I think the real ethical quandary is, if what the Nazis believed about Hyperborea is true, is acknowledging that in any way the same as justifying the atrocities the Nazis committed? I believe my grandfather struggled deeply with that question. While it's easier for me to say given that I wasn't there, I think the answer is pretty clear. No, it is not the same. And the evidence for that rests in something the Hyperborean itself told him. When my grandfather asked if it was still Wolfgang Muller, it said, being right about us does not make him right. In other words, Miller's knowledge of and desire to resurrect Hyperborea does not excuse or condone the war crimes he committed in service of that goal. It's the ultimate expression of ends, not justifying terrible means. Even the Hyperborean saw it that way. <laughs>